Malnutrition is one of those things that really is at the crux of everything you do. Um, one of the things we wrote in this IAAF statement is that at the elite level, you know, athletes will probably do maybe 500, 800 sessions of, of training a year, but they'll eat three to four times more than that. And so even though training is a very powerful stimulus to how good you get, nutrition is doing more because it's got more opportunity to be able to modify how the training works out. I mean, you're not obviously going to get the results without the training, but the influence of nutrition is consistently there to be able to use. Now, sometimes people say to me, how did you get to be a dietitian working in sport? And I have to say, nutrition was a really important part for me of growing up. It was always mentioned in my household about how important it was, but there was an ongoing battle with us kids and eating our peas. So that's always stayed in my mind about how important it is to eat your peas. So when I've been thinking about what an elite athlete needs to know a long time later than my mother had an opportunity to tell me, I've come up with the peas that are important for elite athletes and athletes along the way to being elite to eat. So what we're going to do is work our way through those peas and work out why my mother was so correct in being insistent that we had to do it. So the first one is nutrition needs to be planned. It doesn't happen by accident. I have a 15 year old who is an elite swimmer and I'm on his case every day because if I leave it up to him and good luck, to do even as a 15 year old with the amount of training that he's doing, there's no way he's gonna bump into the kinds of things that he needs to do to get the best out of his training. And we can give athletes really rich information about how to get the best out of those training sessions they're doing towards the goals that they're facing. And it's a lot of, about the timing, the amount, the quality, the type of nutrients that are going to be important to support their goals. But as I said, that's not the information that's most important. That's all kind of good principles, but you need to plan it. And the reason why you need a plan is that we can talk about nutrients and say, oh yes, you need this high quality protein and you can need this ascorbic acid or whatever it is. But people can't translate that into foods readily. So they need something to interface between nutritional recommendations and what they see on their plate. And as I just said before, the food environment that we live in and the opportunities to eat and drink over the day, particularly as you start to become really busy, are not going to align with the goals that you've got. So you really just can't afford to have, as I said, have that good luck. And the other thing is that appetite or thirst or the things that drive a lot of us to eat aren't always going to line up with what you need. And that's particularly the case for young people and for older people. And so I have to be on my son's case about taking the water bottle to training and check it when he's come home in hot weather about how much he's drunk because he'll say, I didn't feel thirsty. Well, I have to say to him, well, that's not good enough in terms of knowing whether you needed to drink or not. And I'm not just worrying about the fluid. When he's doing a two hour session of, of hard training, swimming training, he needs carb support as well. So I can't leave it up to whether his body's telling him something, or whether he remembers between chatting between his friends, what his nutrition goals are. There really has to be a plan. And so that's what the bread and butter of sports nutrition is. You know, I'm a scientist, I'm a researcher, but the best thing I can do is to turn all those things that I can research and find out into really simple plans. And that's what sports dietitians do. And sometimes that's the thing that you really need to have happen with your athlete, that interaction with someone who can do that planning. And sometimes it's better if it's not you or better if it's not the, your mother. My son doesn't listen to me at all. It drives my husband crazy. My husband keeps saying, one day, one day you're gonna know who we were. <laughs> You've got to have someone who can give that advice, that, that sort of objective, and it doesn't have that sort of political or emotional or whatever it is baggage attached to it. 
to get that plan worked. And sometimes, you know, with the parents in the room, so that if it's a, a younger child who's, or a younger athlete who's um, needing the advice, you've got the parental support and understanding about what it is. We had a lot of our meals in the car on the way to and from things. And my son's always got food, you know, in his bag as he's going to things, different to the other classmates he's got because he's got different needs as an athlete. So if that's one message you get, it's important to be planned and important to have sometimes a professional to help that plan be made so it fits the nutrient requirements and the lifestyle of the athlete. All right, our next P is periodized. You know, it used to be that people thought you had that athlete's diet, or even as you got more specific, you know, the, the shot putter's diet or the hurdler's diet, and then you got it right and then you just ate it every day. Because once you got it right, don't change what's working. Now, of course, we know that that is completely un, unscientific and not a good way of going. And that, you know, if we're talking about plans before, the biggest plan that the athlete's gonna have is their yearly training plan that helps them to work out what they're going to try and achieve in that year with their competitions. And then working back from that as to where they are when they start the plan, doing that gap analysis of saying, what's the difference between the characteristics I need to have to be successful at the Olympics or the youth games or whatever it is, and where I am now, and what's the kind of training that's going to build up the characteristics that are going to be important for me. And of course, you all know that the, you know, the foundation of your coaching is that periodization, being able to build up all those different kinds of sessions, integrate them so that they all contribute to gaining those characteristics that are going to be important for the success at targeted events. And so nutrition, as I said, has a role in saying, what's the training session all about? What can I do with nutrition to get a better outcome? And you know, you know just how how much an art and a science this is. You know, this is the kind of level of sophistication that I'm sure you're working with with some, some of your older athletes and you know what we expect of elite coaches these days that they're thinking a year, sometimes four years ahead, and they've got everything built into those phases and cycles that add up to the big picture. And so what we do with nutrition at the elite level is first of all we start from the big picture, we start with the yearly training plan. And we think about what are the nutritional characteristics of the athlete when they get to their competition? And what are the times of that phase or what are the phases of that program that are good times to work on nutrition specifically? If it's gonna be about changing body composition, if it's gonna be about setting up a race nutrition plan, if it's gonna be working out which supplements work and having some experimental um, strategic use of them, how are we going to build that into the phases? And so we start, from the big picture. Then we work down through the phases, the macrocycles, the mesocycles, the microcycles, and say, when's the heaviest training? When am I gonna need more calories? When am I gonna need more fuel? When am I going to have greatest protein requirements? Am I going to altitude? Am I gonna to have to worry about iron? So we break it all down into those chunks and think about what are the nutritional goals around each um, phase, each macrocycle, each microcycle, each day, and alter the way that we eat to get the best out of those training sessions. Even within the day, we think about, it's not just about, this is what I need to eat in a day and I'll just shovel it all in at some point. It's about thinking about how can I support the training sessions that I'm doing in that day? What do I need to have before, during, after those sessions to get the best out of them? How's the best way to spread nutrition over the day so that it's continually allowing the body to replenish and prepare for the next session. And then there's even more specialised work going on now. I'm not sure if you've caught up with some of the, the new work in nutrition, but we now have evidence mostly coming from looking inside the muscle cells when they're given the stimulus of exercise about how at some times you can actually help the training process by taking nutrition support away from the muscle. And so we know that when you train with low carbohydrate for some sort of sessions, you get a greater stimulus, which might help the adaptation. And so 
We now think at the elite level in the week about what sessions are going to have carbohydrate support for the fuel to train hard and with good quality and what sessions might we deliberately take carbohydrate away from to drive the adaptation. So it's very, very clever mixing and matching. And it is an art because you can look at the science and then when you try and put it into real life, it needs just that experience, that expertise, the feedback from the athlete. You don't want to do too much of it because you don't want to over fatigue or injury risk. But this is where you guys have you know, so much of the power that we need to listen to about your experience, about how to put that science and that art together. We certainly know that's happening with carbohydrate, but there's even some ideas that might happen with fluid that you might deliberately train an athlete and allow them to become a little bit dehydrated during a session as a way of trying to promote the acclimatisation process. So it's getting very clever with the way that we're trying to work. And I'll give you an example later about sometimes we learn these things because we see successful coaches have stumbled on it themselves. They don't know why it's working. They just know that when they do it this way, it works. And then we come along and explain, ah, that's the, that's the mechanism. And once we understand the mechanism, we might be able to tweak it a little bit more clearly to get the result. But that's the work that we do working together with coaches to, to try and, and have this you know, very sophisticated way of changing nutrition from day to day or within the day <coughs> to get the best out of the training sessions. And if you want to read um, uh, a little bit about it, um, there's some studies that have been done or some case histories that have been written up by Trent Stellingworth, who's a Canadian um, physiologist, he's a good colleague of mine, and he works um, with track and field and he's done a lot with um, marathon runners. And the, the article um, that I'm just showing here, I'm not going to go into in detail, but just wanted to show that on the right hand side, there's a graph here where he shows the ratio of the, of the training sessions that he does, the blue ones are done with low carbohydrate, <coughs> the red ones are done with high carbohydrate availability. And at the beginning of the season, he's doing a ratio that changes as you get closer and closer to the race based on the type of training and the goals that you, you're wanting. So um, if you Google the um, Trent Stellingworth and Marathon, you'll find these kinds of articles showing you how you can do this kind of thing. All right, our next P is proven. And we really need to have good evidence base supporting all the work that we're doing with elite athletes. And I'm saying that it trumps the anecdotes. And it's a really difficult time to be a dietitian, I have to say. Everyone who's got a social media account knows more about nutrition than I do. And sometimes when we publish things, you will not believe the trolls that come out and tell you how wrong you are about the work that you're doing. I'm, do I'm telling you, I, in my next life, I'm going to be an astrophysicist because <laughs> nobody will try to tell me that they know more than I do. So what is sports science? It is evidence-based practice. And it's based primarily on the knowledge that you get from research with elite athletes using the kinds of protocols that mimic sport. But you can't do research on absolutely every angle, as you know. You've got to build into it some experience and tuition that helps to fill in the blanks between <coughs> what the research can tell you. And that's what we try and do and say it's evidence-based. It doesn't have to be a study that says everything, but there's basis to it and you're filling in the blanks. Unfortunately, we live in the world, and I've had to steal this idea from Stephen Colbert, who a year, or well, 10 years ago, he came up with this idea of truthiness. And so I've, I've um, stolen that idea and I've changed it to scienciness. And what we live in today, it doesn't matter whether it's about vaccines or climate change or whatever it is, everybody now works on scienciness where if they believe it in their gut, it must be right. Just because you believe it makes it the fact um, and this is becoming really quite difficult in nutrition because you know everybody will be telling you things based on what they believe and it's sometimes difficult to get the cut through to especially when you're working with athletes who've got social media accounts and they're seeing it all the time sometimes difficult to just differentiate between what truly is evidence-based 
and what's just a religion. But one of the things that I'll give you some um, sort of insights with and we'll have a bit of an example around, around supplements is that we talk about a hierarchy in, in science about what's the most powerful sort of information to, to base your ideas on. And scientists often, this is not just sports science, but they often say you have to have bucket loads of studies and then you do a meta-analysis and that's really the, the best kind of evidence that you, um, you want. And at the very bottom of the hierarchy of evidence is the anecdote or the experience. And unfortunately, there's a big gap between what scientists think is the best and what athletes and coaches often think are the best. And I'm not saying that there's right and wrong here because I work in an area where I know that we can't rely on meta-analyses to get answers for athletes. Because when, you know, when we're talking about what a meta-analysis does or what lots of studies do, they're basically giving very generic ideas. Let's take any intervention, I've called it Intervention X. A meta-analysis of 100 studies will give you an answer of, does X work? Does caffeine work? Does polarised training work? And that's kind of so generic, it's not really getting to the bottom of what you need when you're working with an elite athlete. Because what athletes want to know is specific. They want to know, doesn't X work, but does it work for this kind of event? And when you get to work with elite athletes, they're getting really specific. They don't want to know just, does this work for a marathon? They want to know, is it going to work for the marathon in Doha, which is going to be at this kind of temperatures at midnight? And there's not going to be a hundred studies that, that can look at that. So I'm on your side in the sense that we can't expect the type of evidence that a lot of scientists think is the best. We have to start working with case studies and with small groups, working with elite athletes to get different kinds of answers. And I'll give you an example in a little while about this experience I've had where you know, athletes have taught me things that they've learned from that experience that you really you know, couldn't expect the science from the top to understand. But I'll use this opportunity to talk a little bit about supplements because this is an area I've heard that you're all interested in because it's a, you know, it's a big part of the world of sports nutrition. Now I didn't get to be a dietitian because I thought, oh, I'd love to know so much about supplements. I wanted to be a dietitian because I wanted to learn about food. But I've learned if you're going to work in this space, you've got to be on top of supplements because that's a big part of what athletes and coaches often want to hear. And I can tell you at the beginning of my um, career, it was a bit like this, that you had sort of the black and the white. So there was a supplement industry telling lies to athletes. And then there was a the good old dietitian and we would say all you need is a balanced diet and taking supplements just produces expensive urine and so that was how it worked and my job was to you know to be really persuasive and then athletes wouldn't think about supplements again so how long do you think that worked <laughs> yeah not much um, and in 2000 after i'd been at the institute for a decade i thought oh well this isn't working because athletes are more interested in supplements than they are listening to me. So you can't keep saying to them that supplements don't work because it's not true. There's some that do, but the negative message is really just alienating people. So in 2000, we thought, time for the line in the sand. The next time I get asked that question, do athletes need supplements? I'm going to say yes. And boy, do they <laughs> change the world whole lot of people got really cross and said, oh, you've given up, you know, you've gone to the dark side, you know, we don't want you telling that. We want you to keep telling athletes not to take supplements. And I thought, well, I'm not getting anywhere with that answer, so let's change the answer and see if we can change the way that we work with athletes. And so we came up with the AIS supplement program, because once we got the athletes listening to us, because once we said yes, they thought, right, you're someone I want to listen to. Yep, you're on my side you're sympathetic, empathetic. Then we sort of changed what we meant by yes. And that was that yes, supplements can be part of a nutrition program, but let's get the nutrition program working as well. And then we'll pop the sprinkles on the icing on the cake if they're needed later. But it really was a game changer in terms of getting buy-in from athletes. 
And what we did is we set up the AIS Sports Supplement Program because in those days the AIS had scholarship programs that we were in charge of. So I could be the queen of it and say, right, this is what we're doing around here. And it kind of happened. And we ran the sports supplement program and we had education around it. We had provision aspects of it where we, pro we did actually provide athletes with some supplements and we did research and we did governance. And that's what it looks like in the old days. Remember the, <coughs> the old logo? And did any of you ever use the supplement program on the website with all the information that you could get access to? So you, so you sort of knew, knew it well. And what we came up with is we didn't say supplements worked or didn't work, but we came up with this kind of hierarchy of the strength of the evidence. And so we had group A's, which were the ones that had some scientific evidence for them working. And they basically fell into the sports foods, medical supplements, performance supplement categories. We had group B, which were the kind of new and exciting, <coughs> too soon to tell, but they had a bit of um, kind of buzz around them and some possible benefits and we identified that those would be the ones that we'd focus our research on. We had group C which we said were the ones that had no substantial evidence that they provided a worthwhile effect. We didn't say they didn't work, we just said look the, the possibility that you'll get a benefit from that so small it's not a good use of your resources. If you're interested go up to the B's and the A's and then we had the group D's which were banned because they contained um, some of the prohibited substances from the WADA list. And so that's how we worked. And until 2012, while we were still running programs at the AIS, that's what we were doing. And some interesting lessons that came out of it. So the AIS disbanded the programs in 2012, but before it disbanded, two really interesting things had come out of it. Um, the first thing is we did a study of the supplement use of the swimmers in the national swimming team. And some of them came from the AIS programs and some of them came from other high performance programs. Now they all had access to the AIS supplement program on the website because we made it freely available. But when we had a look at the way that athletes use supplements, we found that the swimmers of the AIS program used fewer products, even though we were giving them to it, than those that were outside. And what we found over the time is that when we started working with athletes around their supplement use, <coughs> we couldn't stop them from using supplements, but what we found is over the period of time where they felt confident that they were getting assistance with using the right kinds of supplements, most of them were sports foods, there were very few performance supplements because very few of them actually work, but we found that we changed their athletes' confidence and their ability to use supplements in a more responsible way just through that process. And the other thing that happened was the drugs and sport um, inquiry around Essendon Football Club, where supplements were found to have been a, a you know, just an excuse, I guess, for those footballers to be doing things that were unethical and banned. And we found that the fact that we had our supplement program that was all written down, every time we had given athletes products, it was all not just evidence-based, but it was all documented. So we were so lucky that we were able to show this is good practice. And many of the sports outside the AIS who'd adopted our programs were also lucky because they were able to say, well, we weren't Essendon and we've got proof of how we were doing things. So these days, um, all the NSOs are required to have supplement programs and they're still based on the AIS. We don't call it a supplement program now. We call it a framework. Because what we provide is the education, the information that each NSO uses to come up with their own statement about how they look after supplements within their sport and what they'll do, particularly at the elite level in terms of providing or encouraging or educating or discouraging athletes from doing it. So that started in 2013. <coughs> um, more recently, there's been big changes at the AIS again, and all the sports science departments have been removed. Um, so we've got very few resources at the AIS. We've got me left, and we've got um, another appointment as a 0.6 person to be a nutrition lead for all of the high performance environment. And he and I have thought about, well, we've gone from 18 to one and a half. 
what are the most important things that we can do for the environment with our resources. And we've decided that the supplement program is one of them. That's how important it is in trying to help all sports have a set of resources that they can use to be efficient and effective with the way they deal with supplements. And I'm going to share with you one of the things we're working on now. So we've still got the ABCD. The website looks different because when you change, you have to get new logos and templates and everything. And so the ABCD is there as it used to be. But I'm working on a new thing called an evidence map. And I'm going to show it to you today. No one else has seen it, all right? <coughs> so you're um, going to be the lucky guinea pigs. Because... It's helpful to tell athletes A, B, C, D. It's very clean. You know, these ones have got more chance of working than those the ones. But it really doesn't get to the bottom of how you help an athlete work with a supplement. If you, is anyone using the A, B, C, D or using the supplement information that's on our website at the moment? You are? Good. So we've saying things like <coughs> creatine is a group A supplement which means it's got an evidence base to work. But that doesn't mean you should have a creatine cup cupboard at your athletics gym and say, all right, there's the creatine cupboard, help yourself. You know, there's very specific times and very specific events and very specific ways that you might use creatine if you use it at all. And so what I wanted to do is to try and build up more evidence around the way you might use products, but also to build into it not just does it directly help performance, but does it have other aspects around health or recovery or whatever that might be useful? But also thinking about the concerns. Are there things that you need to think about if you're gonna take creatine? And how easy is it to use? Is this the sort of thing that you really need to get expert opinion around or is it something you can just do on your own? So what we've come up with is this um, concept of this grid. And so all the supplements are up, loaded up the top in order of niceness all like the A's and then the B's and then the C's. And then down the, bot down the side here, we've got all the kind of characteristics. And in the middle, you can see all the cells. And so you can basically look up a product and the characteristic and sort of see if we want to make a comment about it. Now, I've told you before that I'm not going to find a study or a meta-analysis that has looked at every aspect of every supplement for every characteristic. All right, so how am I going to get a score or some information <coughs> around your decision or where the evidence is around that sort of interface of two very specific things? Well, I came up with the idea of having sort of emojis at the top line that sort of give you a, a view of the green, the concern, the red around warnings. But I'm using wisdom of the crowd. What I've done is put together a list of, we've started with 100, but we're going to try and keep building up our experts from all around the world who know things about supplements. We poll them. We say, what do you think? Because it's a bit of, I've read the research, but also I've had some experience and I've got intuition. So experts, if you can poll them and try and get them to work together to come up with an answer, is probably the best way of getting to the information. <coughs> And so I'll show you what, this is what we're working on at the moment. Now, you can't read it all, but we're starting with the, um, you're not supposed to, just to give you this sort of overview. So on this side, we've got all the sports supplements. So we've got sports drinks, sports gels, bars, electrolyte supplements. So the foods first, and then we've got medical supplements. And then it'll go across into performance supplements and the B group, etc. But down the side, we've got the performance types that it might be useful for. And then we've got sort of indirect benefits, whether it looks at health, training and recovery. And then it goes down. We've got more things around indirect. Does it help your immune system, injury risk, loss of body fat, gut damage, sleep, jet lag, whatever it is. And then things about how easy it is to use. Is there individual variability that you need to think about? Are there concerns? Now, every supplement's got a concern. We list what those concerns are. And then this one is about how easy is it to do on your own? Do you need an expert in there? Okay. And what we're going to do with each of those cells, not, not, not everything needs to get filled in because there's no interest in knowing about 
sports, drinks and jet lag. There's no kind of connection, so why make it bother about it? But the ones that have got interest, we're colouring in, and then what we want to do behind them is put some resources, some YouTube clips, an infographic, or something that helps you explain why we came up with that outcome. So does that sound kind of good stuff? Yep. Excellent. So I hope when we get it up, the idea is in the first instance it's going to be a website so that we can work on the concept. And if you like it and you find it in, you know, helpful, then we want to turn it into an app with the SADA. Because the other part of what we're going to do is work with the SADA. So there'll be another bit below here that talks about the doping risk and has an updated list of those products that have been batch tested from that group. Okay, so it'll all integrate. But before we turn it into the app, we need to know the concept kind of works because apps are about functionality, but you need to know that the information you're trying to impart works. So it'll be hopefully live in about two weeks. We're just trying to get the web designers to catch up with what we want to do. Um, but hopefully that'll be a good resource for athletes and coaches. Now, my managers say to me, why are you spending all this time giving out this information for free? And they say, but you know, the English Institute of Sport can read this and so can the um, Olympic Committee in the US. They're, you're giving away all this information to athletes for free. And I say, well, I think that's the best thing out because the en enemy isn't the English Institute of Sport. It's the supplement industry, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And we'd be better if we could get all athletes to a certain level of supplement literacy and then you as coaches and we as scientists can then work on that special source that makes it work for the Doha program or for the specific athlete and the event. Okay, So it's all about trying to get people more on the same page before you go and do your smart stuff. Okay, um, So that's the website address. If you just go to um, the AIS website, you'll find it just by finding <coughs> nutrition and, and supplements. Hopefully it'll be so well known that it'll trend or whatever things do these days. I don't know all the smart words. But I'll use this opportunity now just to show you that lesson I told you about how sometimes we scientists think we're too smart and how things change. So this is, an, this is a handout, true, that I wrote in 1994 to help some marathon runners um, before they were doing a marathon <coughs> about how to use caffeine. <coughs> and you know, I said, oh, you know, caffeine's just built for the marathon and this is the dose, six milligrams of per kilogram of your body mass and you take it now before and this is why you take it. And uh, you've got to be careful about fluid because it's a diuretic and blah, 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 blah. So if I was writing that today, <coughs> that's how much of it I'd write again. That's how much has changed with the way that we think about caffeine. And one of the ra reasons that we've made so much change is that we started to look at what athletes were actually doing. So here's one of the examples. So this is a photo I took at the Beijing Olympic Games. This is the road race. And this is about two thirds into the road race. And there's our soigneur. And she's got a bottle in her hand. And it's because it's clear, you can see there's some brown sticky stuff in the bottom of it. But I said to her, for goodness sake, I said, I sent you all that Gatorade. Where is it? Why is it in those bottles? And she said, oh no, the, um, the cyclists used it for the first two thirds of the race. And then they want to switch to um, flat coke. I said, Coke. I know Coke does good marketing, but why would you do that? And she said, well, you know, it's for the caffeine. And um, no, we're not the only ones that did it. Look, Frank Shorter did it when he won his marathon in the 72 Olympics. And he had his, um, he, at his aid stations, he had flat Coke towards the end of the race. And he did that because it had caffeine in it and extra carbs. It's, you know, more concentrated. I said, oh, for goodness sake. That's about one to two milligrams of caffeine. And you know you have to take it an hour before in a dose of six milligrams. Why would you bother? Like, seriously. And you know, that, that extra carbohydrate, it's too concentrated to empty out of your stomach. You, oh, you know, 
have I talked to you anything? So we thought, here's the way we'll do it. We'll do the study to show how wrong it is, and that'll teach them. So we set out the, um, the study. We had them had a cycling protocol. We had them do two hours at steady state so we could see what was happening with metabolism, and then they did a time trial at the end of it. And so we had four conditions. One where they had just a placebo, so they had sports drink right throughout. And then in the other groups, we had the six milligrams of caffeine taken an hour before, textbook signs. And then another one, we had the six milligrams, but we spread it throughout the race because athletes were saying that they liked taking it during, not just before. And then one, we had the coke being switched out at the end, and we measured the performance of the time trial. And there was a 3% improvement in performance in every situation where we had the caffeine compared to the placebo. And we said, oh, you know, there was a placebo effect because they knew they were getting the coke. So that's, you know, they just willed themselves into doing it. So we went back and we did the study again. This time they had sports drink up until the two thirds and then they switched to a cola flavored beverage once it was just a 6% carbohydrate, no caffeine beverage, so it just looked like a Coke, but it was the same as a sports drink. Once we topped up the carbs to 11%, once we put the caffeine content, which was only about one and a half milligrams of caffeine, and then once we had the real thing, so it's extra carbs and that little bit of caffeine. What do we get? With the Coke, a 3% improvement in performance. Now, I'll tell you what, as a scientist, if you can repeat your own studies and get the same results, that's incredibly harder than you think. But we showed that the athletes were right and that, that extra carbs, even though we said they wouldn't be able to empty it from their stomach, and even though we said that that amount of caffeine wasn't enough, it was able to improve performance. So. Basically, what we ended up doing was learning from the athletes, and that started the whole business of looking at caffeine differently. And what was amazing about it is that everybody uses caffeine during the day, and they know you know how to titrate how you drink caffeine or coffee or whatever it is you take it in to make it work in your lifestyle. And you don't take a bucket load in the morning and that's it for the day, do you? You normally have a bit to perk you up in the morning if, you, if you're a bit tired, but then you do whatever your activity is, and then as you're starting to get tired or have a break, you have some caffeine, and a little bit perks you up. And you know when you're tired, that caffeine has more of an effect than when you're fresh. So we kind of all knew about it from our everyday use of it. We just hadn't thought of applying it to sport in the same way. We thought sport was different. So isn't that interesting that we've um, had to learn that way? I read something one time about the high, high amount of sugar in sports drinks. And some company would, that was being lambasted about how much sugar was in, they said it's because it, it helps the, the beneficial part of it get into the gut faster if there's high sugar. But Could that be why the yeah. <coughs> Well, the Coke is probably higher than we think is optimal for emptying. The 6% is probably the best balance between fluid and carbohydrate being delivered in the same um, efficiency mm -hmm. but you can and we'll talk about this at the end you can train your gut to be able to be better at, at, at tolerating and absorbing higher carbohydrate amounts if you practice with it because mm -hmm. your gut's like a muscle it's, it's train it and it'll do it yeah. all right I'm gonna get back to my peas personalized so we know that the same program doesn't work for every athlete in your program even if they're doing the same event we start to need to get specific with the way that we do things around the characteristics of what they're doing and about their personal characteristics. And some aspects <coughs> of it we can now predictably say means there should be a difference. Um, age, sex and calibre are some of the characteristics that we might need to discriminate again. And this whole just individuality is another one. And here I need to have a shout out and say that, you know, women don't get a good look into lots of aspects of life in terms of equality with men, but one of the things that they don't get equality in is how often they're subjects in research. And I have to put my hand up and say I'm one of the worst of the offenders in science because most of the studies I've done in my life are with males for one reason or another. So I'm calling myself out and saying I'm going to do a better job. But 
we've got to realise that doing studies on men and then saying that translates to women is not necessarily <laughs> right because men and women are different. And you know that as a coach, don't you? You coach men and women differently. And so in nutrition, we've got to think about the differences that might happen, <coughs> whether it's body size or whether it's different hormone environments, whether it's differences <coughs> in their nutritional status. You know, women are more likely to be iron deficient, for example. And all these things and other stuff we don't understand could make a difference. Now, in some cases, when you do the studies, you find there isn't a difference. One of my colleagues recently has done a study looking at caffeine in men and women and found they reacted the same way in terms of performance. But you have to do the study before you can just assume that's the case. So <coughs> some things that we know make a difference, but there is lots of stuff that we know makes a difference, but we can't explain it. This is all this individual responsiveness. Now, one of the things that's happening in science at the moment is that we tend to do studies with, you know, 10, 12 people in them. And we're moving away from just giving the mean result this t these days. We now talk about individuals. And so this is the kind of thing you might see. I've just made this up. This is this intervention X I've created. And I've pretended I've done a study looking at um, the effect on performance. And the mean result is a 2% improvement in performance about 1.2 seconds, I'm making this up, which would be meaningful in sport. But when I have a look at all the individual athletes and plot them, you can see that there's quite a range in the way people responded to intervention X. That's about par. When you do a study, you'll find it like that. Now, what's happening <coughs> in science at the moment is people are doing that, but then they're saying, oh, yes, well, those red people that went backwards, they're the non-responders. And all the green people, they're the ones that respond to whatever intervention X was. Um, so that's what's happening in science, but I don't think it's a good thing because the million dollar question is, what's happening? Is that just day-to-day -day variability? Those two red people didn't get enough sleep the night before, or one of them had a fight with his girlfriend, or, you know, you know that there's just day-to-day -day differences in the way people respond. And even in a study, that will come out. You don't know whether it's measurement error, that the way that you had the stopwatch on those two was faulty, and so you've recorded their responses wrongly. Or it could be individual responsiveness, but just on the basis of one experiment, you can't tell. The correct answer is, who knows what's going on in that study. And so what we're trying to get scientists to do these days is to try and repeat some of the <coughs> experiment to see how robust that difference is. And sometimes, you know, when you do studies and caffeine's a good one, you'll find that some people <coughs> tend to be a smaller responder. They'll have a consistently lower reaction to the, the caffeine than others. And you know that probably with your coaching that, you know, some people just need different kinds of training sessions or different kinds of ways of approach based on that. I'll just finish off with one thing on this idea, and this is this, um, this new move to this personalised precision medicine, and probably you've got Craig in the room here, he can speak to it more than I can, but just say that this is you know, the, the way that people are moving to understand that not everything, but some of our responsiveness to stimuli in the world can be <coughs> predicted based on our, our genes. And that some of us get different forms of genes than others, and this is you know, where this personalised medicine is going to, trying to measure differences in people's genes to see if you're more likely to carry the gene that is more likely to give you a risk of breast cancer or whatever it is. And this is a move. It's, um, it's an interesting phase that we're in at the moment because we know that it may be part of our future, but in lots of cases it's pretty early in the phase and it's pretty... Um, it's oversimplifying some complex things. I'm not sure if you've sort of been touched by people ringing you and saying, you know, you can have all your athletes typecast, you can come in and get them tested and we'll tell you if they've got the gene for sprinting or the gene for running. You think, well, I can work that out for myself. I can just get them to run around the... And so there's a sort of a, I guess, a debate going on as to whether we're ready to come out with some of the aspects that we are. But I'm just I'm going to make the point that um, Craig's one of the, the people that's been working in this space and he's... Um, done some work around caffeine that's really interesting. This is from a paper that he's written. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's really interesting work, 
But at the moment, you'd have to say it's interesting, but it's hard to know how to make use of it because even when we can look at different forms of genes and say, well, this makes the person less likely to be able to metabolise caffeine quickly so that they'll respond differently to caffeine if you give it as a supplement, when you do those performance studies, they're not showing consistent results. And so I think, you know, we're early on and maybe we can ask Craig in, when we get to question time about where he thinks we are about how to join up the dots. But that's probably something, that, you know, maybe before the end of my career that we'll be able to do more with. We'll move to the last two things and that is sports nutrition needs to be practical. Um, that really need to think about what's logistically possible and what makes the athlete feel happy when you're coming up with your plan. And sometimes we overcomplicate things. Um, it says here that this, this guy has chosen a breakfast with a degree of difficulty of 5.85. <laughs> and that's, you know, sometimes as scientists we get so pleased with ourselves in coming up with all these really smart things that we just overcomplicate it. And that we really need sometimes to be able to make it as simple <coughs> as possible, make the athlete feel confident they've got a good plan. And sometimes we have to realise that we can't make that plan work. You know, ideally, if I was to say to a soccer player how they would fuel and hydrate during a game, I might have them having something every 20 minutes. But the rules of soccer is that you have no access to food and fluid until half time, 45 minutes plus time on. So there's no point thinking about doing it differently if, it, if, if it's not a possibility. So sometimes you have to go with plan Bs and make that the goal. And then the final one is that our nutrition plan needs to be practised. Why do we need to practise it? Because we need to tweak the plan <coughs> based on the feedback we get from trialling it out, seeing what went well, seeing what we could improve on, and then continuing it. So all continual redesign. And one of the really good examples of that at the moment in track and field is the two hour marathon. So Elliot Kipchoge's had one big crack at it, he had a team of experts around him and he had other athletes doing it and they came up with a number of different kinds of features they built into that plan around the pacing, around the, um, the drafting, around the shoes, around the nutrition. Didn't make it by, you know, just seconds. And so now he's <coughs> going to do it again. And so what we do with athletes is we debrief them after every big competition right away while I remember how the plan went, not six months later when it's just a, you know, distant memory and we tweak the plan, what was good, what was bad, what needs to be changed. And the final reason for practicing the plan is that most parts of your body are organs that can be trained. And so when you practice your plan, you can adapt your physiology to get better at it. And one of the ways that we see that most um, interest of interest at the moment is gut training. People or athletes often have difficulties being able to stomach things before, during, after exercise that you want them to do for their nutrition goals. And they'll say, oh, it made me sick, I can't do it. And what you can work with that athlete to do is to train their gut through the practice to become better at it. And so that's one of the, the big areas that we work on with endurance athletes at the moment um, to make sure that what they're wanting to do in a competition <coughs> is something that they've adapted their physiology to be able to be really good at doing. So there's my six P's. And what I want to try and do is put them all into the blender with my athletes and have them come out with another six P's. And that's what we work to with elite athletes.